Oh, you can be great. Whatever it is you put your mind to, you can achieve. Once you believe anything is possible, you can get it. Welcome to Personality Profile here on Joy 99.7 FM every Thursday evening. We seek to inspire you. We seek to bring you a very wonderful story. And this evening, I have one such amazing story to share with you. The story of perseverance. The story of facing all the odds. And getting it to the top. Yeah. This evening, I share with you a pure inspiration. One of the stories you hear and you ask yourself, what is my excuse? And then you, you make a sharp U-turn and say to yourself, I am able, I can make it. We have captioned this story from Adidome to Harvard. Yeah. A young man's rise from obscurity to the world's best universities. My goodness, you'd love to hear the story of McLean Saba. We affectionately call him Mac, who's studying at Harvard. And he's here with me on Joy 99.7 FM. Welcome, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm and you're looking good and you're looking like a, a, a World Bank boss, you know, nominee or something of the sort already. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny because on, on my way, I caught myself saying Lexus Bill. Lexus Bill. <laughs> Lexus Bill. And that surely means that I'm in good company. You, know? you are in good company. I'm really <laughs> glad that you've uh, joined us in here today. I mean, I heard your story. I heard a bit of it. I'm like, no, man, we need to explore the story a little bit more here on joy 99.7 fm for our listeners as well because it's a very inspirational story uh, we get to learn your journey from adidome right all the way to harvard that's where you currently are I just graduate or you are just graduating right. when are you graduating I, I graduated on may the 30th on, on 30th of may right wow right. right what did you study at harvard so i did a, a master's in design studies in risk and resilience design studies in, in risk, risk and resilience, resilience. what yeah. does that inv- involve Fundamentally, with all the uh, b- before before I actually delve into the nitty gritty of that, do you mind if I pray? If I or, if I offer uh, no, that's, a word that's, of prayer to, to Lord Almighty, yeah. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the unique opportunity to be on this platform, a platform that in many ways is reserved for the deserved. That you have allowed me, an undeserving servant of yours, to to be here today. I want to use this unique opportunity to thank you and to ask you to use this as a channel, as a vessel as a conduit to send hope to people out there, to the hopeless, to people who are wallowing in despair, that at the end of the day, all of us can congregate and say that the Lord Almighty has used McLean Saba as a vessel to reach people who've lost hope. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's a powerful one. Are you either religious, are you spiritual? What what is it? What's your inkling to the spirituality? Yes, I mean, I think in many ways... um, I, I get to be the, the beneficiary of sort of the heroism that's been associated with my story. Mm-hmm. But if you decode that, I think it's fair to say that one, has been mostly by the grace of God, and two, by the people that have been in my life, particularly uh, my father, Mr. John Mensah Sarwa, who passed away in 2016, mm. and my siblings, particularly my sister Stephanie in the United States, my brother Reagan, who is a pastor, my brother Salom. Mm. My sister Kofi, my brother Martin, my, my, my sister Hagar, my brother Michael, my brother Mark Kofi, who lives in, in London. So I think at the end of the day, I think the real heroes are the people who have propelled me and have provided support in many ways uh, that, has, that have helped me actually sit here today. So I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart and also to my mother's family, the Titiati family in Adidoma. But I also, I think you did mention in a story that from Adidoma to Harvard, you know, I think uh, it was supposed to be from a Didoma Secondary School to Harvard because I am actually from Mepe and Bator in the Volta region. Okay. Didoma, however, is the place that I went to school. Wow. So tell us about growing up in Mepe. Is that it? Right. So my and, and Bator. Right. My parents actually come from there, but I was born and bred in Yeji in the Bronx and what is now the Bono East region. Right. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Yeji. In Yeji, not right. Mepe or Bator. Right. And, and tell us about growing up. What, what, what were the circumstances? I mean, I read a bit of the story that I saw on my jaw online from uh, Fueled by Means Inexplicable to Him. Uh, McLean was driven to overcome poverty, get an education, 
and then he used that to give back to his community and whatnot. So mm-hmm. let's let's talk about that. The beginnings. What, what kind of life were you living? Where, where were you living with your parents? Mm. T- tell us about it. Right, right. I'd like to begin first of all by sort of grounding my story in what I call sort of the apotheosis of your typical Ghanaian story. I speak English. Right, right. 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 Meaning uh, that we, here we speak English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 meaning that my story in many ways is very uh, evocative of many Ghanaian stories. A lot of people have studied with colors and lanterns, and I, and I think some people even have them worse than I do. But what I do, however, want to want to emphasize is the fact that at the end of the day, what really matters is the degree to which all of us are sharing our stories so that we can inspire people out there. Because no matter how grand or difficult your story is, and no matter how easier it is from 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 mine, there is someone out there who can resonate with you, someone who feels. Uh, uh, who, who can empathize with you and then if you were to do that it will help them over the long pool to begin to draw from your story and to begin to cling to hope in, in times of hopelessness uh, to begin to believe that it is within their potentialities also to emerge to greatness so yes back to the question right. tell us about growing, growing up, up back to Bono East, Bono Bono region is Ye- that is that Ye- it? Yeji, Yeji, <laughs> right. I, I want to understand right. where you grew up. Right. Um, what was the family setting? What was it like? Right. So I was born and bred in Yeji. Uh, Yeji happens in many ways to be um, a centerpiece of life around the Volta Lake, which was set in motion, I think, after 1965 with the construction of the Akosombo Dam, which led to a massive change in the ecosystem of the. Uh, Volta River and the lower basins of the river where my, my folks, uh, we call them the Tongus, are from. So there was a mass exodus of people from my father's uh, hometown, Mepe, Bator, Adidoma, Sugakope, to up, upstream along the lake. So my folks sat, settled over there and I was, I was born in the 80s over there. Now, when I was born, I think things were slightly good. Um, I did my first nine years of school in Yeji. Uh, there was no electricity, there was no running water. And, and that's, as I mentioned, is, is, is synonymous with, with many of the people who lived there. Um, up until when I was just about to graduate uh, from JSS, my father suffered a stroke, and that completely distorted and changed my trajectory. So the secondary school that I was supposed to go, uh, there the, the was the, 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 the wasn't money for me to do that, and so I went to Adidoma Secondary School. So. Growing up in Yeji, you know, Yeji is, is a fishing community. Well, what were your parents doing then? My father was a boat builder. Um, a boat builder? Right. And uh, your mom? Uh, um, f- my mom wasn't in my life at the time. So who d- you just lived with your father? So I grew up a little bit um, a little bit with my, my grandmother up until... Where, I was, where was your mother? So my mother and I separated when I was about... it. Uh, your mother and you and not your father? <laughs> right. My mother and my father separated and I happened to be to sort of suffered the brunt of that. Right. So by the age of one and one point eight, okay. I happened to be under the care of my my grandmother, dis- my grandmother okay. um, who took care of me for up until I was like maybe five. Mm. And then I moved to this was in Mepe and then I moved to Yeji. To Yeji. Uh, my father had, had moved to Yeji uh, with his new with a new wife who, who happens to be my, my stepmother. Your stepmom. So I moved there to, to join them and to, to sort of get the upbringing that uh, every child needs, uh, getting that father figure to be able to orchestrate their, their did, did you have siblings? I, I have siblings, yeah. How, how many did you I have? have there? seven siblings. So you were eight? Right, on my father's side. Yes. And, you, and you, you all lived with your stepmother in Yeji? Most of us did. Uh, my fa- my brother at the time was was uh, was living in Accra with an uncle of ours, mm-hmm. and our firstborn also lived in a village across the the river in in Mepe. So, so those were sort of in and out. They would come in yeah. when school was in recess and and go back, and so, uh, so a few of us lived with my my, my father in in Yeji. Mm. Your father was a boat builder, right? Uh, was it fancy? Well, I mean, that was the the the, uh, the occupations at the time revolved around along, around the lake. So there were people that my folks were mostly fishermen, and then you have the Ashantis who came and bought the fish and sold it in Kumasi, mm. and you had the Northerners who most, mostly had uh, yam farms and things of the sort. So I think initially, you know, things were okay initially, up until my father suffered a stroke and was basically all all around the country trying to make sure that he was he was healed from that, and so. I think we were left on our own. Uh, my sister Stephanie was very instrumental in, in making sure that we 
we, 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 we didn't go astray. So we were left mm. on our own, basically, with some of his apprentices. And so... Um, um, Did you have to do some work with uh, boat building? Did you have to engage in his activities as well? So interestingly, my father, um, I think he had, he had had a vision for what he wanted his children to turn out being, in the sense that he didn't allow us to, to participate in his occupation. And I think later on in my life, I wanted to find out so what we'll underpinned that. And he mentioned that he had actually been very observant and had realized that many of his compatriots were, were having children come to their shops and learning how to make little stools and tables and things of the sort. And so when they saw these, these in the market, it sort of dissuaded them from going to school. But he, so he wanted us to be very focused on you know, making sure that we did well in school. And that's why he was trying to hide us. Uh, prevent us from actually gaining those kinds of skills. Mm. So how bad did things turn when your father stro- suffered a stroke? So my father, when my father started, uh, suffered a stroke and I graduated from um, junior high school, uh, junior high school in Yeji, um, I was supposed to go to Bishop Herman College, uh, but unfortunately the, the, uh, the, the finances were in there. And so I initially started at Yeji Secondary School for about a year mm-hmm. and uh, things went completely awry. Um, I was in, I think I'd lost that luster uh, for learning that I had, I had, I had always inculcated, and so in my second year I was brought to Adidoma Secondary School, which is at the time was also a day school, and so I was supposed to start from the second year. But I started in a class, and I think it was economics, and I just couldn't fathom it was demand and supply, and I just didn't know the sort of the ins and outs of it. So I thought that my the foundations I had received at Adidoma Secondary School were very bad, and that I I thought thought it wise to go back and start from the beginning, and so. At the Doma Secondary School, day school, I started from, I went back to Form 1 and then did my three years over there. Mm. Mm. So, um, I, I assume that from, from this point, things were very normal. Mm. Uh, you didn't have to struggle uh, with a lot of finances or hardship or what, well, t- t- tell us. Uh, not, not, not necessarily. I mean, things weren't, because this... I think this had coincided, as I mentioned, with my uh, my father's uh, ill health. So he was he was on the run most of the time uh, to, to to make sure that he had healed. And the, the finances were in also there. And at the Duma Secondary School at the time, in comparison to what they have today, uh, is completely different. You know, it's a far cry from the at the Duma Secondary School of today. Uh, there weren't enough teachers. The, there weren't enough books. You know, very library that wasn't very well equipped uh classrooms were in um warehouses that were built by the russians after the, after uh, after independence uh, very bad but you know badly lit and all of that so it wasn't necessarily very easy and i think it was by a virtue of the de- dedication of a few teachers particularly one from um nigeria his name was kolawale alashafat and he he dedicated himself to teaching mathematics social studies uh, a lot of things so it was just the sheer dedication of those people that I was one of the very few to emerge out of there to Ligon, which was also my first time in Accra. Mm. So, yeah, it wasn't the easiest of paths, but I think with grit and the sheer grace of God, uh, we just gave it our all. How, how were you paying for your school fees? School fees, you know, my father here and there, I think he had sold most of his properties by then, um, most of his, uh, you know, his equipment and all of that. So... And then sometimes we'd have to work in farms to be able to buy books um, because there were some. No, you, you, the children, or who? I, I, me- I meant like in Adidoma. Like students mostly, some, most students mostly did that. So oftentimes we'd also have to do that. So I think for me, I was so, I was so very, very insistent on emerging out of that place. And, and I think I had a vision for what I wanted to, where I wanted to go. And I didn't allow the circumstances, sort of the inadequacy and so the ineffectiveness and all of that to get in the way of me pursuing my goals. So, what were your goals then? You know, I think when I was young, there was a kind of mythology that was sold to me by my father. And uh, the story holds that uh, my father had a brother, a younger brother, who, I think, no, another brother, who was supposed to leave uh, for the Western world, I think it was probably the United States or the United Kingdom to pursue further studies. And I think a couple of days or maybe a week before he left, mm-hmm. he was involved in an accident and he lost his life. And so there was a lot of mythology around his brilliance and how much he dedicated to pursuing his academic academic goals and all of that. And and there had been there had been suggestions or even I would say a mythology that I had I was reincarnated. So in many ways, I think I had. I, I felt that I had, I took it upon myself that I had a shoe to, f- to fill. And so that also propelled me. 
but I think my my one of uh, my my thirst for knowledge comes from my my some of my uh, experiences in Yeji. I remember when I was very young, uh, there was a guy close to our house who 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 usually bought newspapers. So there would be older people that would go over there to read it, and um, I would have to wait sometimes for as long as three hours to be able to lay hands on some of those. But you know what that did for me is it allowed me to acquire so much knowledge, and I just realized the sheer relevance and importance of knowledge. Because oftentimes when people didn't know things about the world, and Yeji was very obscure in many ways, they would say, let's go, let's, let's go and ask Mac. Mm. If there was a doubt about anything in the world, they would say, let's go and ask Mac. So that propelled me to, 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 uh, to have that tenacity to yeah. acquire knowledge. So, and, and it stayed with me since. And I understand somewhere in the North Tongo district, you were bested, you won a best in award at some point. Right. And uh, <laughs> you actually became one of the select few who, to pass the senior high school exams. Mm-hmm. You recall how you wore torn clothes right. to go to the ceremony and what you had to borrow. I shared the story around right, right, right. borrowing clothes <laughs> or something of the sort. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when I, I look back on those and, and I just thank God for, for how, 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 far, how far it brought me. Um, I emerged the, uh, I think in my second year, I was the, the best student in second year in the North Thorn district. And for that, I was, I was invited to come to a ceremony at the district assembly. And so to, to, to go to that, I needed to look decent because my clothes were just, my, my, my short had a hole in it. And my shoes were just, they were just too worn that they couldn't stand, you know, the, one of those bends, you know. <laughs> and so um, I borrowed a shoe. I still actually have the picture now. I borrowed a shoe from a classmate of mine, uh, we call him Ojaro Ahez, and then uh, I borrowed a short from Akuf, uh, Akufu Ajani, uh, one of the people that I was living with at some point uh, during my stay in Adidome, to go to the ceremony. So, you know, I look at that. And are, you, are you still in touch with these guys? Yes, I am. I, I, when I, actually, I, when I came back, I, I went to Adidome, and we just all sat down and just mm. reminisced on the good old days and, and how far the Lord has brought us. Did the award come with some money? No, it was just a book. I think it was like a four Sutherland <laughs> it, it was a, it was an English book, and I, I had always had an affinity, uh, you know, a, a, an interest in knowledge in, in English as a as, as a field of study. So I think it came in handy. Was there a, a profession you wanted to do once you grew up? Yeah, w- when I was young, I I was actually a sculptor when I was growing up in 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 Mepe. Uh, there was so oftentimes when I came back to Ghana and I went to my father, and people visited, they would often ask, "Hey, John, where is that little kid who used to?" sculpt things from from clay and then he would say oh this is him and then they would ask me are you still doing that and i would say no the reason being that you know um you know as well as i do that our parents do not necessarily buy into the arts and so i was one one way or the other sort of compelled to move away from that mm. but I've, I've always had an affinity for i would say i wanted to be a lawyer at some point and also when i was young people thought i had um an, a natural ability or maybe a, a kind of charisma because I remember we had a, a school team. We called ourselves the Swano Stars. We were playing on gravel um, close to a church called Divine Hillers Church. And um, in many ways, I was like the worst player on the team. But oftentimes, mm-hmm. they'll give me the captain's armband. And I often, when I look back and I'm like, why did they even do that? You know, It just meant that I had maybe a unique ability to make a case, a compelling case for why I needed to be. Or maybe if there was, um, if there was sort of an argument, oftentimes would play mm-hmm. uh, teams from different areas of, of the edgy. I had the unique ability to, to convince them and all of that. So they thought that I had a natural ability to lead. So people had always seen me as some of someone that would sort of emerge to, in some kind of leadership position. I don't know what it is, but I feel that God is leading me more toward um, the youth and leveraging my story uh, to restore hope, to, to reinvigorate people who've lost you know, uh, uh, hope, who've lost faith, to, be, to begin to believe that, look, it is within our potentialities as individuals, no matter how difficult circumstances we find ourselves in that with faith, uh, determination and the grace of God, we can certainly do great things. So you passed out of Adidome uh, and now you got admission to Legon. Right. <laughs> Tell us about it. Your first time in Accra. Right, right, right. Yeah, Legon was in many ways, I, I, when I arrived on Legon, I was completely befuddled by the sheer beauty of the place, you know, with the white paints and all of that and sort of Commonwealth Hall, sort of the architecture look kind of baroque and all of that so i was really enamored of that and so for me legon was was a place that i I came into my own somehow that i began to see city life i think by the second year we learned how to dress you know (laughs) you know and and we're able to like wear loafers and know and knew that um to to, you needed to wear a brown belt with with a brown shoe 
And there was a, there's a guy by the name Albert, uh, Alfred Amedeke. When I, when I arrived in, in Accra, I remember in my first year, he was the first person to bring me to Tudu. And that was the first time I actually had fried rice with fork and knife. And I remember I was completely confused as to how to use it, <laughs> you know. So when I arrived in Legon, back to the Legon story, when I arrived in Legon, I, I had roommates, great people. I still, mm. I'm still in touch with uh, Sean DeRay and uh, Shadow and many others. And I think some of the people on the floor would often, they would often call me One Man Union because <laughs> I was one of the very few from my cohort to come to, to Legon. Yeah. And, and Legon, um, at the time, there were difficulties getting places to sleep. And I think I, my, my, mine is illustrative of many other challenges that other people face. Mm-hmm. So I was putting my bed, I was a preacher, basically. Yeah. Putting my mattress in my uncle, uh, Christ's uh, floor for, for the first year, uh, up until even the fourth year. So I, it, was only, it was only my fourth year that I got a bed. So Legon was not very easy. It was tough. You know, I, I remember wanting to put together, I think it was around 2 million CDs at the time to go to Legon. It was difficult to put the money together. I had to cross the river and go to my aunt, uh, Davia Ku in, in Adidoma. And she, she was very instrumental in my ability to, to, to collect the funds that allowed me to go to Legon. I also mm. arrived kind of late. And I remember in my second year in Legon, Legon had this tradition at the time of Put, putting on a notice board, students were in the top 10, 10% of their class. Mm-hmm. And I think my name was on one of those. And my roommates came back. I think some of them came back and said, Adidome, Adidome, why you act balapa? They take more like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Legon, Legon wasn't particularly easy, but it was, for me, it was uh, a window into the world, a window into sort of the grand nature of life and, and what mm. you could learn beyond the confines of Adidome Secondary School. Was, was, was your daddy better by then? No, my, my father had my father was sick uh, uh, from GS, from GSS up until he passed in 2016. So he's had a stroke for all his life. Uh, for I think he was like around 50 years old, pretty early. Wow! And he sold many of his uh, belongings and moved to his hometown in Mepe. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. What did you study in Legon? So I, I did uh, sociology and social work. Uh, that's what I majored in. Mm-hmm. But I started off with linguistics, uh, Russian. Uh, uh, sociology and political science. Okay. Mm. So where did the whole U.S. story start? Oh, yeah. Um, so in my third year at the University of Ghana, I think, I think I had come back one day from studying. I, I had this, uh, this uh, tendency to spend the night in mathematics department all night. I would study over there. So I think I came back, and I think one of those days that I didn't have, and I didn't have money. I was kind of hungry, to be honest. So I was laying in my bed, and, and someone showed up and tapped me on, a, on my, one of my feet and said, hey, look, I'm, I'm Ghanaian. I live in the Bronx. There's something called a green card lottery, and I wanted to take a picture of you. And to be honest, I, I was so oblivious to that. I didn't know about anything of the sort. But fortunately, he took a picture of me. He left, came back, and took a picture of me. And then a couple of months down the line, I got a letter in the mail that had, been, had won a lottery. And I'd actually never heard about that. So I went to, I went to the interview and I, I, they gave me the visa. And I, that was when I, I moved to the United States. It was in my third year at Ligon, to be honest. The person, you didn't know the person from I nowhere. Didn't, I didn't. And they just came to take a picture of you. And got, and got my address, yes. And that's all. Right. And that's, yeah, and that's how I, I found myself in the States. You didn't yeah. stay in touch with the person? Uh, not very much. Yeah. But di- did you eventually get to know who the person was? Right, right. We talked on the phone. But there were, um, there were a few things in the mix that you know, I, I, I would like to keep confidential. Uh, but over time, it, I, I went to the United States. And I, I just that. want to demystify the mm. whole thing because, right. mm. yeah, I, I get the, the confidential part. Mm. But this is somebody you didn't know. But right. they just come take a picture of you just mm. like that and, right. and put you in a lottery. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if, in many ways, I think it's, 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 it's grace, you know, because I think if God wants to change your life, he does it in ways that's, that, are, that are beyond our understanding, in mysterious ways, uh, that is. So that, that person took a picture of me and got my address, and I got, the, I got, I got a letter in the mail and, um, and, and moved to the United States. Did you eventually get to know why the person took a picture of you? Right, right, right. I got to and, and why was that? No, I mean, I think it was just something he did. You know, he just he just felt the, this this gravitational pull to, to wanting to help people. And did the person know you before taking your picture? No, no, he didn't. But they came to your room mm-hmm. to tap you. Right. <laughs> are, you, are you still in touch with this person? Somehow, somehow, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and and was this person also a part of the lottery? 
No, no. This was a Ghanaian who lived in, in the U.S. Okay, so mm. the, the person just lived in the U.S. Right, right. But did the lottery on your behalf? On my behalf, yes. Ah. Right, right, right. So uh, when when you got a letter that you've won a lottery, mm. um, you abandoned the Legon studies? No, I didn't. I did. So I went to the States. The initial plan, I, to be honest, was to move to the States and maybe um, pursue my education over there in the United States of America. But, you know, I think when I went to the U.S., I had this this pull to wanted to come back to finish my degree, uh, uh, particularly because I was on track to doing very well and getting a first class. And so when I got there, I was doing a bit of research on what it would take to go to school in the United States. And I saw the exorbitant fees that were being paid, and it didn't make any sense to me. So I wanted to come back to finish my degree. And I think that was even a big, a big, uh, there was a scuffle. <laughs> there was a bit of a misunderstanding between me and my family. Because I think, if you know as well as I do, that uh, Ghanaians, uh, or maybe a lot of people around the world, are in all the United States of America. And so to win a lottery and decide to come back. But I'm glad I did that because in many ways, I think I had a vision. And I thought that um, uh, if I did come and finish my degree, I only had one more year. It'll, it'll set me up to be able to go to graduate So you came back to finish the degree? I came back to finish the degree, yes. What, what did the lottery award you? So the, it, it, it entitles you to uh, permanent, permanent residence in the United States. That's all? That's it, yes. And um, it didn't afford you an opportunity to study in any school? No, that's totally, totally up to you. I mean, up I to think, you. Yeah, they, they give you the opportunity to go there. How you orchestrate your life while you're there is totally in your hands. So in which year did you go to the States? So I finished Legon in 2006. So I, I went to, I went to, I, I left right, uh, and then the ceremony was in 2017. So I left right after that. No, 2007, sorry. 2007, 2007, sorry. Okay. Right after that, yeah. <laughs> so right after that, you left and you've been in the States since. Yes, I've been in and out. So I actually spent some time. You didn't mention that as well. Um, I don't know if you're you're, you're aware. I didn't know. I didn't only go to Cambridge, uh, Columbia. Uh, sorry, Harvard. I also went to Columbia. Yeah, I, I I know that we're going to go there. Okay. So so I went I went to the states and then uh, I think I it took me like about four years because it was very difficult to adapt to the new environment. About four years to get back in school. And so since 2010, I've been in and out of school, combining work with it. <laughs> it's 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 quite an interesting story. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around um, how you even got the the the, the lottery thing yeah. and how this person found you. Right? Um, <laughs> it, is it not a little mysterious, or maybe it's because you are keeping some some of the information? Yeah. Is it is that it? Oh, or yeah, you, I mean, you feel it's probably some divine revelation or some angel or some. I don't I don't get it. I mean, with uh, uh, there's this. I mean, there's not a modicum of doubt in the fact that our, our, our journeys in life are orchestrated by by God, and God has the unique ability to imbue that with mystery, you know. And so, a lot of times, things will happen, I mean, and that's not that's not even that's only like a minutia of many of the many of the mysteries that have happened in my life. So, I, I feel in many ways that encapsulates God's ability to channel. Uh, a, a path for you and I think that this, that was also part of the grand plan for God because mm. that is what has set me to in, 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 on, on the motion to the United States of America to acquire I would say the skill set what I what I call the boon so I'm back to impart you know like if you if you're familiar with uh, Joseph Campbell who who delves, uh, delves into kind of the, the complexities of mythology you go and then you acquire mm. the boon to come back and bless your people with it, you know. And so for okay. me, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm back to... So when you got back to the mm. States, mm. Uh, what did you do? Now you're done with your degree, you're mm. back to the States. Right. What was next? Oh, it was difficult. You know, I, would, I was actually thinking that uh, having, having gone through sort of the difficulties over here, that was the end to it. But life uh, in the U.S. also began on a very difficult note. Um, I remember when I arrived in, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, it was really cold. And, you know, as well as I do, for the African boy who grew up in that weather here that's very, very hot, it was, it was a, a, a difficult transition. So uh, my first job, actually, was at the bottom. Like, I was working at a, at a bus station called Boston bus, uh, South Station Terminal. And my role was called a red cap, which basically is like an advanced Sky I.O. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So what I was doing was, uh, if you arrive at the bus station, I would be the person to put your bags on a cart 
and push it for you. So I'll do that whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, and I'll do that to help help people go go go, go get get a cab, a taxi, mm. or you know to go to the train station. So it was difficult. So I was doing that, and and then I kind of transitioned a little bit to doing security. So okay. I was very busy while I was doing that. I think at one point I mentioned to a couple of people that I wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted to go to an Ivy League. Some of my <laughs> some of my coworkers, and they just couldn't stop laughing. I was just cracking them up. They were just like you. Go to an Ivy League? You're mm. kidding me, right? <laughs> um, and so from then on, I, I I I started off with an uncle, and then I moved to be on my own. Um, I was living in a in an environment in a community which which had predominantly people from Central America, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador. Mm -hmm. It was a very filthy environment, to be honest. I remember uh, at some point my it, it was the place was infested with bed bugs, actually. So I'd wake up in the morning and these little creatures would suck the blood out of me. The whole, you know, the whole, my, my bed spread would be full of blood. So it was very difficult, but it took me about four years, actually, when I graduated from Legon to find my feet and to go back to school because adapting to the new environment without the necessary mentorship and all of that, mm. it, was, it, was, it was hard. It was very difficult. But, you know, by the grace of God, I, I, I went on. And, and, and I, you, got, you got admission to Columbia University for right, starters. Right. And what did you study there? So I did a, a Master of Arts in Social Organizational Psychology okay. and a concurrent uh, uh, graduate certificate in Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. Okay. And yeah. from there, what did you do? Because I know you've attended about three of the top universities. Right. By the grace of God, yes. So after mm. Columbia University, where did you go? So I went to Cambridge. Actually, you know, even the Columbia story has an undercurrent of determination. Because I remember when I arrived, I applied to Columbia. I applied to Cornell. I applied to Brandeis University and I was rejected, but mm -hmm. I didn't lose hope. You know, I still I still worked hard. I, you know, took my GREs and all of that very seriously before I applied the second time and got accepted to Columbia University, to Washington University in St. Louis and Georgetown University. And then I went to Columbia. I did my, uh, my, my, my degree there for two years and then to Cambridge. But Cambridge, I would say it was more like I had a primordial attachment, what I would call in the, when I was growing up. I listened to the radio at some point. And, and I heard Oxford and Cambridge. So it was just one of those things that I wanted to do. Uh, so after that, I, I went to Cambridge to fulfill that childhood ambition. Wow. <laughs> what did you study at Cambridge? So I was uh, at the Judge Business School, and I did a, a Master of Philosophy in Innovation, Strategy, and Organization. What made you decide to go to a third, which is Harvard? Right, right, right. So, yeah, that, that brings me to... In many ways, the orchestrations of the, of the Lord and how you can go through difficulties and, and hardships and tribulations and obstacles and adversity. But the big man out there is, is channeling or orchestrating a journey or a path that's, that is beyond your imagination, that is beyond your ability to grasp. So what happened was that when I came back from Cambridge, um, um, after Cambridge, I went to live in India. I worked in India with Tata for a moment. So when I went back, I, I, I was working in banking with City, And in 2016, I had, I had been there for almost two years. And uh, I lost my job because they discontinued operations in Massachusetts, the state in which I lived. And so I, uh, coincidentally, my sister had a baby. So I took it upon myself, you know, an uncle to go and babysit. So I babysat for, for four months, changing diapers and, and just like singing for her, bathing her. And, and I learned a lot. Uh, you know, from a baby, I learned a lot about compassion, about patience, and all of that. So, just when I was about to get back in the job market to start applying for jobs, my father passed away in Ghana. Mm. So, uh, this was in this was he passed away on August the 10th. Uh, and so, before I left Bo uh, Boston to come to Ghana to bury my father, I showed up. Uh, I was just at Harvard Square, and I, I saw that they had an open house. It basically means that, you know, they set tables and they have presentations to prospective students. So I wasn't really looking to do a third degree. I, so I showed up just to find out, out of curiosity, what was going on. So there were students from all over the world, you know, students who were brimming with enthusiasm to have their names written in the annals of this great institution. So the staff gave several presentations, you know, about the admissions process, about life on campus and mm. all of that. So after that, they gave us an opportunity, uh, prospective students, an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves and talk about their, 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 their journey. So it started from one person, and then it went to another person, and then another person, and then all of a sudden it came to me. And so, you know, I started talking. I, I talked about my interest in playing a role in solving many of the social issues my community, my country, and my continent faces. 
uh, my, my, my interest in the broader issues of the world, of climate change, of wars, and more importantly, my interest in, uh, in many ways, changing the narrative that you see in, in the Western media of African children that are uh, naked you know, and sick to like children that are healthy and well clothed. So the professors were you know, pretty impressed. So they, they, one person got up and said, you need to be here. You need to be here. You need to be here. And I thought it was kind of a joke, you know. Um, and so when the, when the open house was over, I was invited uh, to his office and I'd actually written a proposal for a PhD and all of that. So we talked about sort of the novelty of my, some of the things I wanted to do and how sort of the multidisciplinarity of my background allows me to be able to decode or dissect issues from so many different standpoints. And they were looking for scholars of the sort. And so they encouraged me to apply. I came to Ghana. My father was buried. After my father was buried, I went back to Boston. I was like, you know, running around like a headless chicken trying to put together my application. But God being so good, I was able to do that. And I think was, that, was that given to you on scholarship? Yes. Yeah, so three months later, I got the news that I'd been accepted. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 had, wow. I, had, I had a grant from I mean, them. And that's when... Very divine journey, if you ask me. Right. And I'm, I'm glad that you actually keep mentioning the, the rule of God. Right. Uh, <laughs> God in in your journey, right. I, I think it's it's really commendable. Right. Uh, so what uh, now? Mm. I, I know you mentioned earlier that you were given permanent residence. Is right. that it? Right, right. Are, are you a citizen? I yes, I am a citizen. Yes. Whoa. Okay. So yeah. now you are an American citizen as right. well. Right. right. Wow. Uh, that's why everything about you is American. They they give you the accent as well. Whoa. Uh, looks like you've lost you've lost the Ghana accent totally. Hold on, I, mean, I guess it's by osmosis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, we'll be wrapping up pretty shortly, but then all this journey has taught you quite a lot of lessons, hasn't it? It has, it has yes. Chief it has. amongst them will be what? Well, I, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs in my, in my journey, and one of the things that I have learned along the way is the, I'd say, the importance of humility. Um, I think oftentimes uh, people like us have, the tendency to be slightly disconnected from the people uh, that we serve. And I think I like to call the people who have their backs against the wall. Um, and so one of the things I've learned, even now, that's, you know, uh, in many ways people would think that, you know, Max, Max Sarba is on, is on the path to, to greatness. Tomorrow I could very well be down, you know. And so for me, that means that when I meet people, I should be humble. I should have the ability to, to bring myself to, to them. I should telegraph an energy of humility, you know. And so that's one of the lessons I've learned. I've also learned in that, you know, in life, you would have people that will that'll put you down, but you need to have self-belief. You mm. need to believe in yourself. But more importantly, ground that self-belief in, 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 in fate and, and, and God's ability to, to get things done for you. Because at the end of the day, we are just vessels and conduits through which he's expressing his magnificent magnificence and his omnipotence you know yeah so uh, i got a message here from daniel uh, it says regards to maclean saba my roommate in legon he was truly a strong man i remember he would take a, a girl to on the run legon and come back to eat gary <laughs> 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 daniel Akapo. Uh, he's a researcher in uh, I, I can't pronounce this university's name but it's a, a, a university in netherlands is it yeah <laughs> okay well Thank you very much for your message, uh, Daniel. Okay. TT <laughs> uh, says, Lexus, I am here. CT sends a message from the States. Mm. He says, I am here, now a citizen with my wife and two kids. We still don't know exactly who did my lottery for me. Mm. I've never done it before. We suspect it's my brother-in-law, but we are not sure. And he's not sure either. Wow. <laughs> uh, totally divine, isn't it? Amazing. Well, yeah. interesting comments coming through. But, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, your story is quite a divine one, I should say. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray that God will continue to keep you right. um, as well. For the youth as well, you've seen a lot. What would you advise? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd like to tell them, I have a couple of points I'd like to, to accentuate. It's important that they have. A, you have a vision for your life. Believe in yourself and let go, let go of self-doubt. Mm. Be relentless. Have the ability to bounce back in times of difficulty and adversity. Welcome failure as part of the process. Aspire to goals that are bigger than yourself. And always, and on, I mean always, forgive people who hurt, who hurt you. Because at the end of the day, the same people who hurt you, you God will put you on, in a position that will allow you to even show them compassion mm. and to show them that you are above you know, the mediocrity and the pettiness of hate and all of that. 
amazing. What's your philosophy in life? My philosophy in life is that when I leave this planet, a, a, a lot of young people will be able to say that. And there lay a man who gave me hope, who gave me inspiration, who inspired me in moments of difficulty and hopelessness, who rekindled in me the ability to claim uh, my, 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 my rightful place on the planet and to believe that I too can, can rise to great occasions, rise to great heights, so that I too will be able to telegraph that for people that, are, that come after me. Amazing. Uh, Alexis, say hi to uh, Mark for me. My name is Adam, his uncle's uh, HS wife. We are proud of you, Mark. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so right now you're out of school. You graduated in May, you say? Right. Yeah, right. What do you do now? So I don't know if you're... There was actually a megalomanic article about a young man who's coming to Ghana to solve youth unemployment. <laughs> um, so Harvard did an, did an interview with me, and, 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 and for some reason the title of the article changed, which I thought wasn't very sensitive to the collective vested Ghanaian ethos. But I'm the kind of person who likes challenges, so I've come, and I'm trying to uh, maybe be a vessel or a conduit through which all of us can collectively uh, begin to see how we can think and ideate about youth unemployment. So I believe that education is a big component of it, and, and that sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch between the education young people receive and the demands of the job market, or sometimes there's inadequacy or, I would say, a lack of entrepreneurship skills that people gain in school. So my role is to maybe, I want to, I want to set up a foundation so that we'll be able to equip them with skills and expertise. And so as it is them. now, you don't do anything. Is that, is that what that, you're saying? That's what, I'm, that's what I started So you're doing. working on the foundation. Right. And also been speaking and all of that about sort of the, the gravity of the issue and how all of us need to you know, put our hands on death. Okay. It, yeah. um, does it mean that you're not going to go back to live in the States? I, so the work I want to do, I think I'll alternate between the States and here because the problem is here. But I do believe that uh, the, 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 the resources, that the, the networks that God has put me into has, allows me to be able to draw on resources that I wouldn't otherwise be able to get my hands on here. So I think I would alternate and be able to use maybe the systems over there to see if I can raise funds to come back and to, to, to do many of the things that I want to do for the young people. I, I want to get to understand really what you say you want to do in Ghana mm. very well. Mm. Um, you want to set up a foundation. Right. That would train. Is that it? So the, the foundation is more of a vessel. And the, underneath that is, is the goal to set up um, a kind of innovation entrepreneurship fellowship to, to give young people the skills, the expertise, and the support they need. Is that is that business? No, just to set up their own businesses. So basically, no, no, no. For you, is that yeah. business? I, is this that, sounds like a... Uh, business as in if it's for, for profit or is that what you well, say? Well, yeah. I mean, I want to understand. Now yeah. you have you have three degrees mm. from Cambridge, mm. from uh, Harvard, mm. uh, from what's that one again? Uh, Harvard, Cambridge, Columbia. from Harvard, yeah. Cambridge, Columbia. Right. W w what work do you want to do, or what work are you going to do? That's so, what I'm saying. So that's this is a component of the things that I want to do. That's okay. just one component. The other one is what I call Maxaba Global. I feel a gravitational pull to, you know, helping extricate many of the young people around the world and giving them the ability to, to see the potentiality in them brought to bear. So uh, more like a, a public speaker? And a leadership institute of sorts. Okay. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a speaking component to, it, to that. And I also own what, what I call EDACME. So I advise a lot of young uh, professionals and young people that are pursuing mm. further studies in the United States for professional development. Okay. That's a component. And then in addition to that, I think I would also maybe do a corporate, something corporate, and then deal, these are the other things I'm doing on the side. So I think I'm going to be very busy, but I do like the challenge. I do like the ability to touch the lives of people. Well, it's been great spending time with you, Mac, um, and God bless you. You have a very amazing story and a divine journey, I should put it that way, and I wish you all the best, and uh, may you be able to impact Ghana and, and the world. It's the grace yeah? of God. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank amazing. You as well. Max Saba, wow, amazing story. Here yeah, on Joy 99.7 FM. Thanks a lot to my team, Adam Knight here, Philip Naya, Biku Sankofiso, Nofori, and Elizabeth. Well, Papa Bile is coming up. He's sitting in for Uncle Ken today. So it's going to be a great night of good music, African music, and some good jazz, and some soul music as well. I'm Lexus Bill. Have a great, great evening. Tomorrow, God willing, we are back at 2 o'clock with another fantastic edition of Drive Time. Enjoy. Yeah.